Can they even can they hear us at least? They can now. Hi guys, I am so so sorry for all of you that said um, have been sending messages saying has it started yet. I thought I'd click start, so we we have ended up just having a chat by ourselves, answering the questions that are coming up and realizing you're not hearing them. So we're going to start again. Do not worry, you are going to get to hear everything. So here is today's session about um, aerospace. So Mr. Olson, would you please like to introduce yourself, and then we'll put on your PowerPoint again. Second time's the charm. OK, so uh, hi, my name is Tyler Olson. I am a, uh, a thermal engineer working at NASA Langley Research Center. Um, my career has taken a, a kind of a winding path to get here, but uh, in, in uh, you, you guys would call it a uh, secondary school. But uh, my dad and I took a trip down to uh, Kennedy Space Center to try, try and catch a shuttle launch. Uh, we didn't quite make it, but we got to see a lot of cool stuff while we were there. So, you know, the vehicle assembly building in the background here on the left. Uh, the space shuttle on the launch pad here on here on the right, and then uh, some Apollo command modules that they had there. This was back in 2009, so um, the shuttle program was still going. Um, we uh, Kennedy was still a busy place, um, and I, I'd always been fascinated by uh, aircraft and spacecraft. And uh, up until um, I went to university, I, w I thought I wanted to build uh, airplanes. Uh, in university, I got to work for a student group called the Space Systems Research Lab, and uh, uh, we built, we worked with things called CubeSats. So uh, this first one was called Copper, and it's like a little 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter cube, uh, and it carried an, an infrared camera to look at uh, propellant flumes from other, other spacecraft. This thing launched back in, I think it was 2013 or 2014, um, off of a uh, Centaur rocket in a uh, Wallops flight facility in Virginia. Uh, the they had an unknown failure in orbit, so we never heard back from this one. But we did we did get to touch something that went to space. Uh, the second one here, Argus carried a uh, uh, electronics package to look at you know radiation exposure in orbit. And uh, this one went up on a Super Stripe B rocket in 2015 out of Hawaii, and this was an experimental launch vehicle. Uh, the rocket didn't make it to space, so. This cube is somewhere at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Um, I, after I graduated from uh, St. Louis University with my uh, bachelor's degree in aerospace, I went to Wichita State University, uh, also for aerospace. Uh, I don't have any cool pictures from that one because it was mostly analysis work, uh, so I didn't get to play with any hardware. Uh, but after Wichita State, um, I went to work for a company called L3 Harris. And uh, they build uh, weather instruments. So this spacecraft on the on the left here is called GO-17, and it's a uh, weather satellite out at geostationary orbit. And we built uh, this instrument up here at the top. It's called the Advanced Baseline Imager. Uh, and it's, it was a partnership between NOAA and NASA, which is the US, uh, NOAA is the US uh, uh, National Oceanic Atmospheric Agency. Uh, and if you've seen a, a picture of the Earth like this here in the, in the bottom right, which is like the full disk of the planet, it probably came from one of our instruments. Uh, so I worked for them for three years, three and a half years, uh, before I got my current job, which is working as a uh, thermal engineer for NASA Langley Research Center. And uh, here I've worked on uh, inflatable heat shields. Uh, I've uh, helped with uh, thermal vacuum testing. Uh, arc jet testing, and um, uh, I even got to help test a part of the uh, Mars Perseverance rover uh, heat shield while it was here back in uh, 2019. Um, so that's sort of a, a crash course in my, in my career, a little bit more condensed the second time around, um, and I'm sure we have to re-answer a bunch of questions now. <laughs> um, so let's uh, let's go from the top, I guess. Guys, yes, yeah, so as I said, I'm, I'm really sorry for everyone that has been wondering why they couldn't hear us and we we're wondering why there weren't more questions coming in. So first things first, which is the fastest NASA rocket? Uh, so that is uh, off the top of my head. It's either between the Parker Solar Probe, which is currently in close orbit around the sun, or the New Horizons Probe, which flew past Pluto back in, I think, 2016 or 2017. Um, Speed is kind of an interesting question with rockets because it, it depends on what you're trying to, what you're trying, how heavy the thing you're trying to throw up there is, and where you're trying to put it. Um, orbits are constantly trading uh, potential and kinetic energy, 
So usually you define them more by altitude or by energy than you do by velocity. Excellent. So next one is the SOGIA rover that's on Mars. Um, is it still working? Uh, the Sojourner rover was NASA's first rover on Mars. It wasn't the first lander, but it was the first rover. And um, no, it's it's still there, but it's no longer operational. The uh, uh, solar cells are either covered with dust or degraded to the point where they can't provide enough power for the rover to turn on. Uh, so it's you know it's still there, but no, no longer working. How many tons of um, a rocket fuel does it take to put um, a rocket in space? And are there any alternative fuels we could use? So it depends on the rocket and it depends on how heavy your payload is. Uh, so most rockets use something called uh, RP-1, which is, uh, you know, it's basically kerosene or the stuff you put in jet engines, but more refined and uh, liquid oxygen uh, for their first stages. And uh, it, it gives you a lot of extra thrust uh, using that combination. Um, some rockets like the space shuttle use uh, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen which still gives you a good amount of thrust, but it's also uh, more efficient. So you, you get more uh, basically miles per gallon out of that. Um, in terms of, I'm, I'm sorry, what was the second part? Um, so, so it was other alternative fuels they could that could be used. Alternatives, okay. So there is a wide variety of rocket fuels that they've been making for the better part of 60 years now. Um, most rockets use those two that I just talked about. Uh, they're looking, a lot of companies are looking to go to uh, liquid methane and liquid oxygen. Um, it provides the same benefits as uh, um, the uh, RP1 and, and, uh, and liquid oxygen combo, but it has uh, fewer, it, it burns more cleanly. So you have fewer, um, less, you know, gunk in your, in your rocket engine, less, less, uh, uh, I believe the word is uh, uh, char or uh, let's see, what is it? Uh, polymerizing uh, of, of the of the fuel in the rocket chamber, so you, you have more reliable engines. Um, and then there's you know there's the uh, monopropellant stuff like uh, uh, hydrazine and nitrogen, nitrogen tetroxide that's really nasty. Uh, so there's a there's a wide variety of, of options. Um, so why do planets have lower ox um, lower oxygen intake levels? So in comparison to Earth, why do others have lower oxygens and and things? So. Oxygen is one of those, free oxygen in an atmosphere is one of those things that uh, scientists like to call a biosignature uh, because oxygen does not like to stay by itself for very long. It, it has a, a half-life that uh, basically makes it so that other planets without life are much less likely to have large amounts of oxygen in their atmosphere. Uh, we have here on Earth, you know, uh, algae in the oceans and uh, plants on the land that, you know, exchange carbon dioxide and sunlight for free oxygen. So we're constantly replenishing our oxygen supply. Uh, place you look at places like Mars, where it maybe once had a, a, a usable a usable atmosphere, but most of the uh, you know the iron in the soil has rusted, and that's where it gets its red color. Um, Venus, a lot of the oxygen is bound up in the carbon dioxide. Uh, Mercury is way too close to the sun to have a, a, an atmosphere. Um, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are all gas giants, so their composition is mostly hydrogen, helium, uh, um, ammonia and uh, trace trace gases. So it, it, there's a Goldilocks zone for it and you usually you usually need life to sustain an, an oxygen signature. Okay, uh, can animals go to space? Yes, so the ISS has a re has a number of research projects going on. Uh, they, they're they constantly bringing up, you know, different types of, uh, of mice and uh, insects for experiments. Uh, back in the space race, they the, before they launched people, they launched uh, uh, I think the Soviets launched dogs mostly, so Laika was the first animal in space, uh, and then the uh, U.S. used uh, chimpanzees. So yeah, there's a there's a long history of animals going to space. Okay, why do people want to travel? Like, what's the purpose of us traveling to other planets? So uh, the first purpose would be science uh, to find out, you know, what's out there, and where do we where do we come from, and where are we going? Uh, so. For example, here on Earth, you're not going to find many rocks that are older than a, a billion years or so. But if you go to the moon, uh, which has been almost unchanged for three or four billion years, it's a geologist's uh, playground, a, a record of the early solar system. And same thing for asteroids, which are left over from the formation of our solar system. Um, so if, you, if we want to learn more about where we come from, that's where we have to go. 
um, and uh, looking towards the future, I mean, what sort of uh, uh, world do we want to live in? We 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 have all these uh, sci-fi stories of uh, you know living and working in space, and if we want to make that a reality, that's that's where we have to go up there too. Um, and there's there's resources up there that we might not be able to get so easily down here, or uh, services up there that we could provide to people down here. I mean, the, the classic one being uh, communications. Uh, if you uh, like. A live TV TV broadcasts are usually done over satellite because you can put a dish up anywhere anywhere you want and point it at point it in space and get a signal to uh, to a TV. Uh, you can you know uh, there's surveying stuff you can do up there. So if you want to you know monitor uh, the ice at the at the, uh, at the poles of the planet for uh, you know climate change purposes, you can use you can use satellites for that. Um, SpaceX is doing stuff by pr trying to provide internet across across the planet's surface using sat using satellites, um, and then there's you know materials research, so there's applications for that for that kind of thing as well. There might there might be things up there that you can only do up there. Um, for a while, we thought that you wouldn't be able to grow silicon crystals um, in, in large usable quantities anywhere except for a, a, weight, a weightless environment, but we took the lessons we learned up there and we use them down here to grow stuff that you, you that we now use for computer chips. Um, the algorithms that we use for the Hubble Space Telescope are used in mammograms and, ca and cancer research. Uh, there's a whole bunch of reasons to go up there. Um, how long has the Curiosity rover been on Mars? I think it's around seven or eight years. Uh, so Curiosity is powered by a, uh, a radioactive decay of plutonium. So it, it can go on, it can, it can, it'll be able to rove around there for as long as its wheels keep working. Okay, um, so have you worked on or tested a space tether? Yep, is that a thing? Space tether? Space tether. Uh, that is a thing. There was an experiment on space shuttle, I think back in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, with uh, tethers and control of tethers in space. But no, I have not personally worked on tethers. OK, what is the furthest a probe slash rocket has ever traveled from Earth? That would be, I think, Voyager 1 or 2, and both of those have left the solar system. OK, so going to some of the questions that were put in earlier. Um, so what was your favorite subject to st study in school and which of the subjects you studied were really important when you moved into aerospace? So my favorite studies were, phys were physics and chemistry. Um, I had a really good teachers in both of those. And uh, in chemistry, we, we got to do labs playing with different materials. So we got to you know, set magnesium on fire and look at the spectral lines or um, you know, uh, titrated materials in, into, into new solutions uh, for different experiments. It was a lot of fun. Um, and then uh, physics is what really taught me the predictive power of math. And the one experiment that, that sticks with me is my professor had a, a little, you know, uh, diecast car racetrack on one of the desks, and it would it had a ramp that went off, and so the car would jump off and hit the floor, and he was able to use Newton's laws and work them out up on up on the uh, on the whiteboard uh, to predict where the car would hit on the ground. So he then put a a little cork on, on that on that spot, and the car would hit that cork coming off the ramp every time. Um, most useful was probably uh, calculus. Um, it's one of those things where you don't really understand how it works until you see it applied. And I didn't really see it applied properly until I got to university. Um, but uh, you know, it, you don't realize how much of that how much that underpins daily life until you see it in action. Cool. Um so I, I know obviously that you, you've told us before and obviously whilst you were doing your internship. Um, what did your internship at NASA? What was your favorite thing you learned before you obviously then went on to later work for other companies before coming back to NASA? Uh, so favorite thing I learned was, well, it's not really any, any, any one singular thing, but uh, working with the, uh, the software that they use here has been invaluable. So uh, getting exposed to, you know, uh, making things up in a, a computer aided design pro program or uh, an analysis program is something I never had exposure to before. And it was, th these are uh, bespoke software packages. You don't really have to get exposure to them anywhere else aside from the industry. 
Um, and a lot of times these companies will take you on based on your qualifications and teach you what you need as you go. And that's what happened to me. I, that's, that's where I got that exposure. In terms of things I saw that was really cool, um, they had a, 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 a giant robot arm that was laying up carbon composite components, uh, which was cool to watch. Um, they had a bunch of you know unique aircraft in the hangar that you could walk around and look inside, and they uh, you know explained it to you step by step. Um, and then uh, they did a number of uh, hardware tests while I was there too. So they took a mock-up of the uh, Orion capsule and uh, dropped it in a giant pool to uh, simulate splashdown, which was fun to watch. Cool. So I don't quite understand this question, so I'm hoping you do. So the question is, is there a door on Mars? Is there a door? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Cool. cool. That moves on from that one. Right, OK, so do, <laughs> um, do you do lots of maths when you're trying to work on rockets? So it kind of depends. We rely a lot on um, Excel to do, you know, we call them a uh, uh, spreadsheet math. You know, it's it's where you, you don't want to throw the time in to do like a a, a formal analysis with um, with a, a specialized program, but you still need sort of like a, a an estimate, um, and you don't and you don't want to guess. So you go and you use equations that you know to do a uh, to do a quick calculation and figure out okay, eh, it's it's going to be roughly around this, um, and then when you do. Uh, when you actually go to the the, uh, the specialized analysis, uh, it's important to know how the analysis works, but the computer does do a lot of the math for you. Okay, um, so these are some questions that were um, sent in earlier. It's kind of like three questions in one, but they do all link together. So you've got what qual level of qual qualification and experience do you need to work at NASA? And then also, do they have programs that UK students can apply to? So in terms of level of qualifications, it depends on what position you're going for. Um, I had trouble getting a position when I when I graduated from university with the bachelor's degree. Um, I went on with the master's degree and had a lot more, had a lot more luck, uh, but it is sort of an experience thing. The more exposure you have on your uh, to these sorts of projects, the, the, the more likely you'll have you'll be to pick get you'll be to get picked up by the systems. And uh, honestly, hunting for jobs is the worst because every company these days now does it through, you know, online and they rely on algorithms to uh, search through, you know, the hundreds of resumes they get. So you need to find things that match the keywords that the, that the, that the search program is looking for. And, but you also need to make sure that you're not, you know, uh, lying about your experience because when you get to the interview stage, they will find out. Uh, so it's it's sort of a, a, a trade off there. Um, in terms of uh, UK students working for NASA, it, it's not so clear cut. Um, I did look at that before before we got here, and most of the positions I saw required US citizenship. Um, but that's for NASA specifically. Uh, it might be possible to get a position with a uh, a U.S. aerospace company, like for example, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Northrop, uh, SpaceX, but it, it is more difficult if you're not a citizen. Okay, so just be aware, guys, if you are interested in that, that you know you can study abroad. So that, that's something else to think about in the grand scheme of things. There are lots of programs to help people go abroad to study, as well as you know, if if living in America is a big dream of yours, becoming an American citizen is possible. But if yes. you're not planning to become an American citizen, remember we have British. Organ, um, organizations as well. Is it, um, is it BAE? BAE, I think, is the is the big one. But the UK has a has a long history of uh, of an aerospace industry. So um, I know Rolls Royce makes really good jet engines. Um, I don't know a whole lot about the UK involvement in space outside of the uh, European Space Agency, uh, which I think you guys might have trouble with uh, lately. But uh, uh, yeah, there's there's opportunities, and especially if you uh, if you study abroad and you make it to a U.S. university, um, if they have a space lab there, I think I know Utah. You uh, there's um, universities in Colorado, all over the country that have uh, small space programs. Okay, um, is just trying to think. So, is there one way? Um, is there only one one pathway 
and what qualifications are they into aerospace? So working in aerospace as a whole, is there only one set pathway? Would or would you say there is different ways into aerospace? Oh gosh, no. There's there's all kinds of ways in. Uh, so like, just in my job, I've met mechanical engineers, I've met technicians. Uh, I mean, uh, welders, um, uh, electrical engineers. There, there's a lot of engineering to be honest. Uh, but like people from all kinds of all different qualifications and all, all walks of life uh, can work in aerospace. Um, and uh, like, so I, even though I, I studied for aerospace engineering, I am a thermal engineer. So I work with heat transfer and the environment of space and uh, uh, hardware testing. Um, but there's also, you know, um, uh, systems engineers and electrical engineers who work with, you know, programming and organizing the missions and you know planning out concepts of concepts of operations uh there's mechanical engineers who design you know fluid systems so if you want to work on rockets mechanical engineering is a good way to go because rockets are basically you know fancy fancy plumbing assemblies um there's all kinds of ways into aerospace and you, not just engineering but also uh, technicians trade schools will, will will find their way in as well uh, I have a friend who was a, a, a Java programmer who ended up working on um, uh, instruments that went on that, that Go-17 spacecraft, and he had no idea how he got there. Uh, he, he could not believe his eyes that he was working in the space industry, even though he was not uh, an engineer tech by trade. Thank you. So, right, we've got another one here from Cameron. So, do you believe uh, we will need to leave Earth in years to come? If we do uh, do what planet? Um, if we do what what? If we do what planet would best fit humans? That's what we're trying to ask. So um, I'll say right off the bat, there is no planet in the solar system that's that's as nice as Earth. Um, and even if uh, even if like an asteroid that like a similar asteroid that killed the dinosaurs hit us, uh, it'd be nicer here on Earth than anywhere else. Um, it's uh, I can't really see a scenario that would force humanity to leave Earth um, uh, um, not of its own free will. So, but the closest planet to Earth is probably Mars um, in that it's easier to live on than any, any of the others, but that's not because Mars is easy. Uh, Mars is as dry as the Gobi Desert and as cold as Antarctica. Uh, and it's... Um, got one one hundredth the atmosphere of Earth and it's all CO2. So it's it's not a nice place to be. Um, so Earth is where humanity is going to be for the foreseeable future. And uh, my personal philosophy with space is that if we have to make space work for people down here. OK. Um, so one was question was, have you ever been to space yourself? I have not been to space. I have touched things that have been, that have been to space, and I have worked on things that uh, are now on the surface of Mars, and I've helped test things that are going to go to the moon someday. But no, I have never been to space. Um, what about, oh, so they're then saying, what about planets in other solar systems? So would there be planets in other solar systems that we can, in theory, travel to? Um, in theory, travel to, yes. Uh, will we ever? I sort of doubt it. Um, there's nothing unique or special about our solar system in terms of what it's made of, in terms of the elements available here that we can use to build uh, compared to other places. And they're just so far away. Like e even if we take our fastest rocket today and point it at the, at the nearest star, it would take it 10,000 years to get there. Um, we don't really have a, a propulsion system on the horizon that'll get us there inside a human lifetime. Um, so it's more a question of would we want to go there to see what's over there? And the answer is probably yes, but it'd be it'd be a, a, a long term uh, proposition and there'd be significant resources spent here on here here uh, in our solar system. Um, are there planets out there that could support life? Absolutely. Uh, are there any close by? Mm, I don't know. It's probably less likely. OK. Uh, did the heat shield on the Perseverance program have to withstand to land on Mars? Uh, I think I saw up to 2100 centigrade. Um, but it's not, when you, when you think about heat shield, it's not just the maximum temperature, it's also how long it stays at that temperature. 
So coming in uh, to Mars, I think it's moving at something like 20 kilometers a second, uh, or uh, maybe not that fast, but it is really fast and it has to slow down from that speed to zero when it, by the time the rover touches the ground and that space is about seven to 10 minutes. Uh, so you're trading kinetic energy of, of your orbit for uh, thermal energy that you can dissipate from via the heat shield. Okay. Um, do you know how old the oldest person was to go to space? I believe that was John Glenn back in the mid to late 90s, and I think he was either in his late 70s or early 80s. Okay. Um, what's the hardest assignment you've ever been given? Uh, so it's an interesting question for me because I generally generally the hardest assignments are the most rewarding um and there's not usually a single assignment to it it's usually you know here here's this program or here's this project um you know take it to the next the next step or it's end state and you're, you're going to be working on this for years um the most strenuous was probably uh um the uh that that uh this one hang on yeah, uh, this Go 17 right. instrument. Oh, okay. So th this this spacecraft. Uh, so um, back in this was 2018, I believe they they launched this thing in uh, I think it was uh, January or February of 2018. It got up to its position in orbit, and they went to turn it on in uh, I think it was mid May, and the instrument did not work. So um, it. And it, it kind of spiraled into months of me traveling back and forth between uh, the NOAA command facility in uh, in Maryland and my home in Fort Wayne, Indiana, uh, and night shifts and you know lots of hand wringing, hand wringing of how we can make sure this thing doesn't break itself from getting too hot while it was up there, and uh, how could we get the uh, how how could we complete the mission? How could we get the data that we needed for uh, for the for the science team to do to do their jobs? Um, and it was. I won't say it's the hardest thing I've ever done because there's there's almost certainly harder things I've done or, or will do, but it was the most strenuous in terms of uh, physical toll. Okay, so we've got one here from Charlie. Um, in the future, will we have the technology to travel to different planets, stars, and even maybe a ga even galaxies? Planets, yes. Uh, stars, eh, probably far future, but it, it could be done. Um, uh, my my favorite concept is uh, you put a bunch of lasers around the sun and you point it at a uh, at a light sail and it just goes. So you're separating the uh, energy source from your payload, and so you can make it a lot lighter and it can go a lot faster that way. Um, in terms of galaxies, uh, the closest one is Andromeda, and that's uh, like two million light years away. Um, I don't see us going there anytime soon. OK, um, sorry, there was another question I had to hear from a student. Uh, when are NASA likely to start producing launchable rockets? So I'm assuming when, when they likely to spending people back up into space? I know that's not something they do as frequently. So NASA has uh, been investing in uh, commercial um, commercial partners for the better part of a decade now. And uh, SpaceX, I think, is the famous one. And uh, SpaceX is the one that uh, got astronauts from US soil up to the International Space Station for the first time since 2011. Uh, so they're, they're already doing that. Um, and in terms of you know a NASA-owned and operated rocket, uh, that would be the Space Launch System. And the first flight for that, I think, is either later this year or early next year, if I remember right. OK, um, and then the student following on from that question before about um, whether or not we could send first things to the planets. The students here put li like a dinosphere. Do you know what? Uh, you might be referen referencing a Dyson sphere. Yeah, uh, I may have just read that wrong. <laughs> so. Uh, Dyson spheres are tricky because, I mean, the actual tech to build them is, is sort of uh, simple, but the scale of it is enormous. Um, For those of us who are less free, less sure what that means, would you be able to explain what the term dice sure. means? So, uh, there is a uh, a scale that uh, was coined by a man, uh, a Russian scientist named Kardashev, and it's a 
you know, uh, scale of technological development. And it's, you know, uh, um, a Kardashev one civilization uses all the energy that, of their home planet. Kardashev two uses all the energy of their home star. Kardashev, Kardashev three is all the energy of their home galaxy. So it's a it's a logarithmic scale and it's exponential in its in its uh, in its uh, development. Um, Kar we are right here on Earth, probably Kardashev, you know, 0 0.7 more or less. Um, Kardashev two is where you build a Dyson sphere. Um, now. I don't really know what we would we would need such an enormous amount of energy for, uh, but you basically take uh, solar panels or mirrors and surround a, an entire star with them. So it's it's an enormous uh, undertaking. Um, now the actual tech to do it is not super complicated. We know how to build solar panels now, and we, we could uh, you know beam energy with microwaves to different places as as needed. That's that's not exceptionally difficult, um, but the scale involved would mean like dismantling a planet. And right now there's there's no good way to do that. Um, but the technology of space based solar power might be one of those things where, you know, how you bring space to to help the lives of people here down Earth. Um, OK, so um, one of the other questions you have from the student, has anyone ever died in space? Died in space? No, but there have been people who have died on the way up and on the way down. Uh, so, for example, here in the, uh, the, the United States, the two famous cases are, you know, the uh, Challenger disaster back in 1986 and the Columbia tragedy back in back in 2003. Uh, we lost um, 14 astronauts total and uh, two sh two space shuttles from that. Um, the Russians have had, had a number of accidents, but I don't think anybody's actually ever died in space yet. OK, um, is there a Tesla Cybertruck on Mars? No. Cool. Uh, <laughs> sure, there are lots of people who really want that to happen, but no, there's not one yet. OK, right. Um, so we appear to be coming now to the end of the questions, so I'm going to close the, uh, the chat now. Thank you very much, Tyler, for talking to us all. And I'm very sorry for all of those who, of you who are waiting for the first 10 minutes of that talk or 15 minutes wondering why you couldn't see it. Um, I promise you we did start it, we just didn't quite realise we hadn't pressed go live. So I hope you enjoyed it um, and I'm sure we'll look to have uh, Mr Olsen again maybe next year doing another after school talk with you all. Goodbye. Bye.